Thank you very much, Dr. Ali. So that will bring us to our first round of responses, which will, each speaker will have 10 minutes to respond to the uh, previous speaker's opening statements. Um, so please, Dr. Stephen, forgive me, Reverend Stephen. <laughs> I, don't mind, I don't mind the uh, sound of doctor, perhaps that someday soon that'll be a reality. Well, thank you, Shabir, for your opening statement. I mean, there are a lot of things uh, to discuss, and I hope I can cover them all in my first rebuttal uh, within these 10 minutes. And I'll just start by responding to a couple of things you had uh, mentioned in uh, your opening statement. You said that uh, Adam uh, seems to be created in the image of God, uh, according to the Hadith, uh, in that, you know, these qualities of mercy, kindness, and love. But these are, from my understanding, these are all relational qualities, which, in other words, to be a loving person, that, you, that means to be a relational person. You need to be able to have someone to love or someone to be relational with. And prior to creation, there is absolutely nobody. If we're talking about uh, God in, in Islamic theology, uh, the oneness of God, a, a singularity. So it, there's a bit of there's a contradiction there again regarding the relational qualities of man as it relates to God. Uh, there's also another question that was raised: is you know if we you know how do come Christians still continue to commit sin? I mean, hasn't their human condition been resolved? Well, there is still a vast difference between the Christian and the non-believer. And by this I meant, uh, if you look at Galatians chapter 5, Paul goes on to list the works of the flesh, uh, which in other words are a lot of the manifestations of our depraved sin nature. But then he also, after that, uh, begins to mention the fruits of the Spirit, which is to say that a Christian um, does not live according to the works of the flesh. Uh, in fact, he's liberated from the power of sin so that he, by the Holy Spirit he may be able to live in a way that pleases God. And one of the ways that that is reflected is by the manifestation of the fruits of the Spirit, such as, you know, love, mercy, kindness, uh, and, and so forth. And so we see that in Galatians chapter 5, uh, where there's also an understanding that we are also still being sanctified. I mean, the Apostle Paul admitted this in his writing, you know, the things he didn't want to do, he still did, uh, as re referring to that he still struggled with his sin nature, his, his human condition. Is that to say that he's still enslaved to it? No, it's the fact that God is still refining him, sanctifying him. It's a process. It's not, you know, a, you, know you, you come to Christ, you, you become a Christian, you're redeemed, you're forgiven, you're renewed, you're born again, as the scripture says. Uh, suddenly, okay, that means that you no longer have a human condition. Well, no, God still has to work with you. It's a sanctification process. And yes, we will get to that point where we can reflect the true image of Christ. I mean, there's a lot of other things as well. Uh, he, there was also the mention of sacrifice, the practice of sacrifice in Eid. Uh, well, I believe that sacrifice from Eid is a vestige or a cultural memory from the practice of the sacrifice from Genesis prior to the Tower of Babel. And as, it, as we talk about sacrifice, in Psalm chapter 51, verse 17, about a contrite heart, if we understand that passage within its, its context, we understand it to mean uh, in reference to the sacrifices in that God does not find delight in people who continue in their sin and doesn't turn away from their sin and yet they offer sacrifice so as to say I can continue doing as I want a living rebellious life as long as I offer a sacrifice I know I'm good with God and God is saying no I do not delight in that in other words if your hearts not in it if there is not a, a repentant broken repentant heart before God a contrite heart it is not pleasing to him Nowhere does it say, however, that these sacrifices uh, are not uh, required or are not part of the Old Testament law. Another understanding is the Passover lamb. Well, a lamb was still had to be slain to preserve the lives of the Hebrews for the blood to be put on the doorpost. So that means a lamb had to be sacrificed. Uh, just to, so in, in, in many respects, that is still considered a manner of sacrifice. There's also a mention as to, uh, well, it seems death before the fall, uh, which uh, kind of caught me by surprise, I have to admit, but is, is this how God operates? I assume then that this uh, would entail an acceptance of some form of evolution. Uh, and if so, how can a loving singularity, if there is such a thing, uh, call a creation of death, it, with death, good? Uh, in many respects, does that mean that, you know, is man created then uh, as a historical Adam and Eve, or is he the result of evolution? So, you know, I will, perhaps as a fellow Christian, not very clear on, in the Islamic position, that would be something I'd be interested to know a little bit more about as to where that position is. Um, there was also the mention of the parable of the prodigal son. Well, we Christians, we don't build doctrine on a parable. Why? Because a parable is meant to communicate one central concept, one central message. And if you look at the passage uh, in, in Luke, uh, in that particular chapter, there are two other messages as well. It's not just about the lost son, 
you find the lost sheep and you find the lost coin in these parables and the whole central message is the joy that there is not only amongst God's chosen people not only amongst the angels in heaven uh, but it, it is a joy when something lost is found that is the central message so you, it, you can read into a lot of these details of the parables but we don't build doctrine on parables because it's not for that purpose it's meant to convey a central point well I mean, to better illustrate the biblical teaching of our inherited sin nature we can turn to Romans chapter 3 verse 23 which states for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God well what does this mean it means that we are all violators of God's moral law the Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 5 verse 12 that therefore just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin and so death spread to all men because all sinned <coughs> what does this imply that all men exhibit a sin nature in other words we're all born with an inclination to deviate from God's absolute moral law we are prone to wander and prone to manifest our sinful depravity we find that this accurately corresponds to the real world this accurately corresponds to man's nature and therefore this is shown to be true we find that despite the Quran suggesting that we are born upright we can find in the hadith Sadi uh, al-Bukhari sorry if I mispronounce it in book 6 volume 60 number 262 that it states the Prophet said Moses argued with Adam and said to him Adam you are the one who got the people out of paradise by your sin and thus made them miserable Elsewhere we read, Adam and Moses argue with each other, and Moses said to Adam, O oh Adam, you are our father who disappointed us and turned us out of paradise. We also read in al Tirmidhi 118 that when Allah created Adam, he touched his back, and there fell from his back every soul that he would create from his offspring. And Adam forgot and ate the fruit of the tree, and so his offspring also forgot, and he, Adam, committed an error, and so did his offspring commit an error. Well, according to Islamic tradition, there appears to have been a contradiction between the Quranic text and the Hadith as it relates to an inherited sin nature. But the argument is often made, why would a just, a just God blame you for a sin you never committed? And yet, according to Islamic belief, Adam forfeited the Garden of Eden because of his sin. Well, if we reject original sin, why, then do, we, why do we then suffer the same consequence as Adam? Why can't we return to the Garden of Eden? After all, we are his descendants, why suffer the consequence of his sin? It appears hypocritical to question this when it is assumed within the Islamic worldview. Where we find God in the Bible as the standard and source of justice and righteousness, in the Quran we instead find a God that manipulates the scales of justice, making no provision for sin. According to the Quran, Allah just forgives people arbitrarily. And if a Muslim performs good works, if those good works outweigh the bad works, then he or she will qualify for paradise. But in the event that your bad works outweigh your good works, Allah will increase the weight of your good deeds by twofold or tenfold. This really is no different from other religions where works are fundamentally perceived as the method of attaining salvation and righteousness. I mean, consider the story of a man, as recorded in the Hadiths, who killed 99 people. This man was guilty of 99 murders, and in his search for redemption, he came across a monk who told him redemption was impossible. Well, he killed him, and he continued on his journey where he met a scholar. Well, before uh, the scholar informs him that there are wise men at a village that can instruct him how he can repent and be redeemed. But before even reaching this destination, he dies, which prompts the angel of God and the angel of punishment to argue as to whether he should be in paradise or in hell. The angel claimed he had no good works. He had killed 100 people. But the angel of God said he was on his way to repentance. Well, what therefore did Allah decree? He decreed that the distance be measured between the man and the village and from where he was coming from. If he was closer to the village where he intended to repent, he would be saved. But if he were farther from the village, then he would suffer in hell. Well, Allah intervened by causing the earth to shrink between, and, uh, between the man and the village so that he was found to be closer to the village, thus leading the angel of God to lift him to paradise. You see, there is no concept of God's justice or central concept of God's holiness in the Quran. Islam presents forgiveness as an impersonal act of arbitrary divine power, as James White writes. And thus, if there is no absolute justice and thus no absolute moral law, then our moral inclination within us is nothing more than a cruel illusion. Now, this poses a problem to the Quran's supposed continuity as held by early Islamic scholarship, as demonstrated in Gordon Nichols' book, Narratives of Tampering, in the earliest commentaries on the Quran, given that there is a complete lack of redemptive continuity and correspondence to the earlier scriptures. What would you expect in the court of law if someone was guilty of murder? If the judge was an accurate reflection of Allah, he may pardon the criminal of his crimes, and thus he would no longer be a criminal. Is that justice? Is that not the perversion of justice? 
Now, there is no penalty for the crime, and this is what we find in Quranic theology, a forgiveness of sin that does not require that the penalty be paid. You see, it is only in the Bible that we find the mercy and justice of God come together in which the love and justice of God are fulfilled on the cross on Calvary and where it is further manifested in the extension of his kingdom on earth. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Reverend. That'll conclude our initial response. And we'll move on to our further responses where each speaker will have five minutes to respond to what has just been said. So we will have... Uh, my apologies, I'm getting ahead of myself here. I'm very excited. Um, so yes, please, Dr. Shabir, please forgive me. So I'll, I'll set my stopwatch accordingly for 10 minutes. No? Okay. So I've made some notes so that I can uh, capture the most important points that Stephen has uh, made. Obviously, you can't deal with everything because time is limited. I think one of the most important points he, he made is about the, uh, what he calls the arbitrary nature of God's uh, justice in, in, in the Islamic view. And uh, I say the Islamic view because he has relied on both Quran and Hadith while he said the Quranic view. So we should be clear, are we talking about the Islamic view, uh, which includes all of these, or are we talking about just the Quranic view? I think it's very important for our Christian friends to uh, think about what is the Quranic presentation on things before we go to the Hadith, because uh, it is possible that somebody may be thinking, well, uh, tell me which is the Word of God, and the Muslim says, well, it's the Quran. And the Hadith is the explanation of the Word of God, true, but uh, a Christian may be thinking, I want to know what's the Word of God, and what does it actually say? So for many Christians, the focus should be on the Quran. Hadith comes secondarily as an explanation of the Quran. And some Hadiths are authentic, some are not. Some are correctly attributed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, some are not. So it is, uh, I think, very important that when Muslims present the message of Islam to the public, they should first and foremost focus on the Quran and for the public as well. When you want to seek God, you want to know, did God reach down and give us a book? Which is that book? If that is the Quran, show me what it is and show me what it says in the Quran itself before we turn to any other uh, source of information. So in the Quran, is, is God's justice arbitrary? And I say no. I say that God created human beings knowing our weaknesses and he's willing to forgive those weaknesses. Now, uh, we can think about a university professor uh, who uh, knows that his students have had a, a hard semester, the subject matter has been particularly diff difficult for whatever reason, maybe there's a new textbook and people are getting accustomed to it, then at the end he says to his students, you know, you have not all done uh, very well, though you've put in good effort, and uh, for the good effort, I am willing to upgrade everyone by 5%. So everyone is happy, nobody is harmed, and he has actually done justice to the situation. Whereas, if he had applied the letter uh, of, of the syllabus, then he would have marked them accordingly, and that would have been unjust. So uh, God knows in his wisdom how to apply his justice, and he does. Let's think about the Christian situation. Does that mean that God is, is just by killing his son? It doesn't, to Muslims, uh, imply that, because for, for, um, from my perspective, uh, the, the Christian situation is as if God has a bunch of criminals before him, and uh, he uh, is ready to condemn them. He said, criminals, you've all committed sins, uh, you have to die. Uh, but I am merciful, so I have, I'm going to solve this. How? Guards, bring my son. Now, the Garden of Gethsemane, Gethsemane story shows that Jesus was pleading for his, uh, to be spared from the cross. Father, uh, let this cup pass from me, yet not my will but thine be done. Uh, but uh, eventually he submitted himself to the will of God, as the story goes. But, but we can imagine the son coming in, initially pleading, and God saying, No son, you've got to die. Criminals, I love you. So, uh, the criminals go free, the son dies, 
Uh, to Muslims, this does not really reflect justice. Now, what about the story of the, of the man who killed 99, as mentioned in the hadith? Now, we go to that secondarily. We have to interpret the hadith in the light of what the Quran has laid down as general principles. Because it is unimaginable uh, that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, would have been contradicting the very book that was revealed to him as a revelation from God. So, his, the, the words that are reported uh, about him in hadith should serve as commentary on the Quran, but not to override what is already said in the Quran. So the idea of justice and forgiveness is very clear in, in the Quran. What about the man who killed uh, the 99? Now, if God did not uh, give any compensation to the murder of victims, then of course this would be unjust. But if God in the life hereafter says to a murder victim, I know you've gone through a lot, you have suffered, you have been murdered unjustly, and as a reward for that, I give you this paradise which is ten times the size of the world. And the man says, wow, I never imagined anything like that. Let me go back into the world and die one more time so that I can get this sort of reward. Now that man is compensated for the harm done to him. He's happy in the end, and the one who has committed the sin is now forgiven. God loses nothing. The man uh, who committed the crime loses nothing. Uh, the, the murder victim loses nothing but gains in the end. And everybody is happy. Everything is in the end, even Stephen, uh, as I often say. Sorry, uh, Stephen, to use your name like that. <laughs> okay. Uh, what about Gordon Nickel and his uh, writings about Islam? I've read his Gentle Answer um, and uh, his uh, previous book, uh, which was the subject of his PhD thesis, Narratives of Tampering. And I find that uh, Gordon Nickel is uh, a Christian missionary writing from a particular point of view, uh, trying to defend Christianity. And uh, though he's very polite and gentle, as his, the title of his book indicates, uh, he has misunderstood Islam, seeing it from that particular point of view. Uh, maybe eventually he and I will have a debate, uh, because the word is already going around that we should do that. And, and then we will see how, how that uh, goes. Now, the question that Stephen raised before us is, uh, what about return? Turning to Eden. Well, if Adam committed the sin and then he was driven out of Eden, uh, of the garden of the Jannah, uh, then uh, why, are, why are we still suffering the consequence of that? Well, from the Quranic point of view, it seems that this was God's initial plan. Because even though he forgave Adam, he still says to them, now you are to go to earth, uh, this, is, uh, this is the place where you are to live for a certain time. Which would indicate that his placement in the original garden was only for a, a particular purpose. It was not for everlasting life. Uh, other passages of the Quran show that human beings are actually created uh, to be on the earth and to live on earth uh, for the duration of their lives. So this is God's uh, master plan. In fact, it might surprise some Muslims that the classical commentators discuss whether that original garden was one in, in a heavenly realm or actually a garden on the earth itself. And some said that it's actually a garden on the earth itself. Uh, but that, that question does not affect our topic much. The question is still, why didn't we return back into that original garden? And the answer could be, especially if it is a garden on this earth, that humankind could not all live in that one original garden, especially if it was between the Ma Bain and Nahrain, as it says, uh, in, in the Mesopotamian uh, region between the two rivers. Uh, the, the, the book of Genesis shows that uh, it was between four uh, rivers. Well, you know, you can't have all the human beings live in that original garden. We have to spread out, uh, multiply, and uh, populate the earth. This is what we have done. But we can also turn the question back to our Christian friends and ask, why aren't we back in the original garden? And why aren't we back, forget garden, in the original situation in which human beings were before the fall? Now, when St. Paul and others came up with this idea that with the sacrifice of Jesus, everything is going to be made right, they thought this is the end of, war, of the world. It's going to happen any time now. Jesus is going to come back in our lifetimes. He's going to uh, take up the, the ones who have been dead previously. They're going to come back to life. And those of us who are still alive will be raptured up into heaven. This is how St. Paul spoke about it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. He thought that this will happen in his own lifetime. That means, as they were saying, that sin was going on for a long time, and now at the end of the ages, 
God's son has come in to set it all right. He's come and he's paid the final sacrifice. Everything is going to be back to normal. They thought it's going to be back to normal, but of course another 2,000 years have passed and we're still in the same situation. So the question is put back to Stephen, why aren't we back in Eden uh, seeing that Jesus has paid the final price? Uh, more than this, if Jesus has paid the price for all of us, doesn't that mean that we all go free? Because we have committed sins, uh, God demanded his pint of blood, he got it, uh, we should all be free, right? Uh, but no, we still have to have a contrite heart, a broken spirit, we still have to give up sins, we have, still have to do the right thing, we still have to serve God. Well, that was what we had to do before, either before or after the sacrifice. So the sacrifice of Jesus has not actually changed anything, and I believe that this is uh, an important problem uh, for us to deal with. I have a half minute more to go, uh, but uh, I don't want to be contentious and use up all of the time arguing. I want to hear from Stephen as well, so I'll close at this point and uh, invite my colleague to enlighten us more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ali. So that will conclude our initial round of responses, and we'll move on to the, the next part, which will be the further responses, where each speaker will have five minutes to respond. And um, we will start with Reverend Stephen. Thank you, Shabir, for your response. Yeah, so it's it, some great questions there. I mean, uh, I just want to clarify as to why I do refer to the Hadiths, uh, including as well as the Quran. It's because I have met many Muslims who do regard the Hadith as authoritative. So I do acknowledge that there is diversity in the Islamic community as to, you know, some people believe that it's just equally authoritative as the Quran. Others believe it is secondary. Uh, but nonetheless, it does reflect the Islamic uh, community's beliefs in many respects and their understanding in its readings. Um, just in terms of the question that he's turned to me at, why aren't we back in Eden? Well, my friend, it, it, it's coming. I mean, that's, that's what we read in es ecclesiology, uh, sorry, eschatology, uh, the, the study of the end times as we read throughout Scripture. Um, yes, there were many Christians who thought that the end of the world had come, but the truth was that, you know, it didn't. And why? Well, no one knows the time and the hour when, when Christ will return again. Uh, but the thing is, God is working throughout history. God is bringing all things, Christ is bringing all things subject to him. All things are being brought subject to Christ so that when he comes, in other words, the, the earth will be as a renewed Eden. I mean, this is the, uh, this is the eschatological view of the church, uh, of the end times, of, of Christ's coming, that after the judgment, we're not just going to be in some uh, place where we're just going to be relaxing up in heavens with the clouds. No, that's not, that's not the biblical view at all. Uh, we do believe that God's kingdom on earth, a renewed Eden uh, throughout all the earth, where there is no more death, so, my friend, that is coming. That is, in fact, and I would encourage you, you, you to, to look into a little bit more of the eschatological views uh, as expressed by the Christian community. Um, the idea regarding the problem with the atonement, well, the idea that someone else can bear your sins is quite obviously not a concept found nor accepted in Islam, and it shouldn't be understood as that just about anyone can bear another's sin, because according to the biblical narrative, it could only be one who was without blemish, perfect, and upright. Well, according to St. Athanasius, only the assumption of humanity by one who is himself fully divine could affect a change in this creaturely state. You see, by becoming human, human and living a human life, the divine word who is in himself the true image of God restored the image of God that is marred in us. But I often find Muslims to be arbitrary in rejecting the biblical doctrine of atonement when Allah permits that someone can go on, your, on behalf to Mecca as part of the Hajj, the pilgrimage. At least that's what I've been told in my conversations with fellow Muslims. Uh, and that's in the case if you are sick or financially incapable of going. Well, why can Allah accept that someone goes in your place fulfilling one of the five pillars of Islam, but the same principle cannot be applied to the substitu substitutionary atonement that we find in the biblical narrative? I mean, there does not appear to be any reason why Allah permits substitution for the fulfillment of the Hajj and not the other for man's atonement for, of sin. I mean, this I see as inconsistency, the arbitrariness of Islam. Uh, I mean, is God cruel to send his son as a sacrifice for sinners? I mean, does man have the right to judge God's character? Can man's perception of God change the character of God? Well, if we are created by God, then we have no right, nor are we capable of judging God. We are subject to his judgment, not the other way around. And what we want to believe about God does not really determine what his character is. I mean, we can think him cruel or barbaric, but that does not mean that he is cruel or barbaric. I mean, we ought to also consider on what basis man could determine what is right and wrong and what is loving and cruel when he does not have the law and word of God. I mean, he essentially has no standard or foundation by which to make such value distinctions, and I speak of this in man in general. 
I mean, if we are going to question the character of God, we should also question the God of Islam, who is likewise perceived by many to be cruel and barbaric. Uh, I mean, is it not true, after all, that according to the Hadith, the converted Muslim who performs good works must still endure hell for the perfection of his sins? Uh, I mean, is this not what many Muslims believe as it pertains to salvation, and that the prophets and martyrs are the only ones exempt from that purification process? I mean, why is it that we believe that, in fact, that Christians can be born again, and, you know, how is it that we understand that man, uh, in fact, is different after coming to Christ? I mean, we look at that, that's another uh, aspect of the response as well. Well, again, it, it is only possible because Christ, in fact, comes as the God-man. It's just called, understood as the hypostatic union in which uh, we find this in the Council of Chalcedon in uh, 451 AD, in which the council wrote that according to the biblical text, Jesus was truly man of a reasonable, rational soul and body, consubstantial, co-essential, of the same substance with us according to the manhood. You see, Christ was to be acknowledged in two natures, in confusity, unchangeably, the distinction of natures being by no means taken away by the union, but rather the property of each nature being preserved. In essence, Jesus Christ was fully God and fully man at the same time, in which the hypostatic union could be expressed being perfectly God and perfectly man. And it's uh, only the reason that he, we are able to be saved from our, our, our religious, our human condition, and we can see the fruits of the Spirit, is because he is the Son of God. Not, he's not just some man. He is God that came in human flesh and took on human flesh, the second person of the Trinity. I wish there was more time, but unfortunately, uh, this is now the end of the second rebuttal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Reverend Stephen. Dr. Shabir, please. Well, uh, finally, um, after this speech, we're going to have a break, and the MC will uh, uh, in, in, inform us about what follows from that. Uh, so in this uh, final speech, I wanted to be reconciliatory and, and say that uh, I, I'm so glad that we had this dialogue here tonight. I believe that Muslims and Christians have a lot in common. We need to celebrate that which is common, and uh, at the same time, we need to understand the differences. But at the end of the night, uh, I want Muslims and, fr and Christians to walk out of here as, as friends. And uh, we should continue to study the subjects and understand uh, the issues uh, as the best we can. But many of the issues cannot be settled in this life. They will be left uh, to God in the life hereafter to inform us, as the Quran says, about the things that we differed about in this life. Uh, there is much violence in the world, and we need more peace. There is discord. Uh, we need accord and agreement. So. Let me answer Stephen's uh, questions to me. Uh, what about the hadith which indicates that uh, some Muslims may actually have to go through uh, hell for their sins? Well, that actually shows that there is a justice. If God does not forgive you, then you will suffer for, it, for your sins, and you suffer yourself. Nobody suffers for somebody else. لا تزر وازرة مزرة أخرى. No bearer of burdens is going to bear the burden of somebody else. The Quran is fair about this. But the idea in the Quran is that God will forgive you. And if somebody is not forgiven, it's because he did not uh, turn back to God uh, and seek forgiveness. If he did, he would have been forgiven. He wouldn't have to pass through hell. What about Hajj battle or the uh, compensatory Hajj, where somebody performs the Hajj on behalf of somebody else uh, who is infirm and cannot go through the physical processes? And the reason for that is that, as Muslim scholars explain, a Hajj involves a sacrifice uh, of the human uh, endeavor and also a financial sacrifice. Some people are capable of the financial sacrifice but not of the physical. So somebody else can perform the physical sacrifice on their behalf and, and this person is just basically responsible for the financial portion which they bear. So it is fair and square in, in this way. Notice I didn't say even Stephen this time. <laughs> Now, in, in Stephen's uh, first speech, he compared the God of Islam with the God of Christianity, uh, and, and he said uh, that the God of Islam is not uh, understandable, but in his own words, he said that the God that he's speaking about is intelligible to the human mind. These are the words I wrote down when he spoke them. Uh, but uh, as the evening progressed, I felt that he was talking about a God who is not actually intelligible to the human mind. Because he speaks about Jesus being fully God and fully man at the same time. This to me is a contradiction in terms because it involves being perfect and imperfect at the same time. And uh, this is uh, an, uh, an internal contradiction. Moreover, he says that uh, the one who dies for us has to be fully divine. As if God himself has to come down and die for us. But if God comes down and dies for us, then God died. 
And uh, if we're not going to admit that God died, then we shouldn't say that God died for us. Now if you say that God is actually three persons and one of the persons died, do we have one minute left? Uh, uh, if, if we say that God is three persons and one of the persons died, it would mean that one of the persons is expendable. And uh, God, by definition, is not expendable. And all three persons should have all of the qualities of God, meaning that he is not expendable. Uh, so there is a problem there. The question is, who exactly is God? And in Islam, the idea is very clear. There is only one God, the same one God who spoke to the great prophets of the past, who spoke to Abraham, to Moses, and to Jesus. And it is the God who was worshipped by Abraham and Moses and even by Jesus. We have in the New Testament that Jesus fell on his face and prayed to God. Just as Muslims to this day fall on their faces and pray to God. Who was Jesus praying to if he himself was God? And if it's only his human person that was praying, that means that there is a separation between his human person and the divine person. And it would mean then that God did not actually become a human being he must have just simply dwelt inside of a human being. So we have a distinctive human being who's called Jesus. And we have God who is somehow inside him who may come out and leave Jesus as a human being. And I don't think that that is the, the, the definition of divinity from the Council of Chalcedon, which uh, Stephen was referring to. So in the end, it seems to me that the God of Islam is a clear concept and the God of Christianity is not so clear and it becomes confusing when we think about who precisely died for our sins and who died on the cross. Rather than having God die for us, let's say that God forgives us and let us all turn back to God repentant. Thank you very much.